through the Bible and looking at the stories, some of the, just these great stories of what happened as God relays the story to us. Some people have said that Genesis chapter 3 that we're going to look at today is the most important chapter in the Bible. And I, I'm not sure if I'm buying into that, but I understand why they would say that, because it is the pivotal chapter of the Bible for sure. Because the first two chapters, as we looked at creation last week, it brings us to a world that's just amazing. It's, it's perfect. God says it's very good. And that's where we end chapter 2. And then if you skip to chapter 4, you have the first literal death. You have the first two kids who were ever born. One of them kills the other one. And pretty much the rest of the Bible and the rest of human history is just a complete mess. It's just a reminder of whatever happened from the Garden of Eden to now. And let's face it, we are living in the aftermath of that. This week, I was back in Colorado because uh, many of you might remember Don and Helen DeGroat, who used to go to our church and, until they moved to Colorado, but Helen was deteriorating, had Alzheimer's, and she finally went to be with the Lord this week, and so I went back to do her funeral, and, and it just reminded me again, watching people getting old and, and how this is just ingrained in our society, and then this week, a, a kid, John Walters, a, one of Garrett Hill's uh, teammates at the U on the USC water polo team died um, this last week. And pray for his family. They're, they're going to be dealing with Today there's a paddle out for him. And, and then I think on Saturday at Mariner's Church is a service. And you go, on the one hand, you see somebody who's really old and they die and it's kind of a relief. But you see somebody just snuffed out in the prime of their life and you realize, you know, these guys who, to them, life has been throwing a ball around in the pool and now it's something that'll change their lives forever. And that's the world that we live in. Well, Genesis 3 explains how you go from a perfect world to this one. And so it is incredibly pivotal for us and important. So the story goes like this. The end of chapter 2. God had created this beautiful world. And he made Adam and Eve, and they were perfect for each other. And each of them was the only one that the other one had even seen or known. And so Eve was the most beautiful thing that Adam had ever seen. And Adam was the greatest guy Eve had ever met because they had never met anyone else. They were, they were put in the Garden of Eden. Now, don't think of it as like a little, a little garden where the walls would be closing in on you or something. It, was, it had four major rivers flowing from it. it. It was probably hundreds of acres it had all this wildlife, and animals wouldn't hurt you. They would be your friend. It had everything that you could ever want to eat. It was full of fruit trees. And God had told them, you can do anything you want. Here you go. He, oh, by the way, he said, there's just one tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, just don't eat that. And they're like, okay, yeah, I mean, we can eat anything else. Yeah, you could pull up a plant out of the ground and eat it. It'll be fine. There's nothing poisonous. There's nothing wrong. No thorns. Just go for it. What an amazing environment that must have been. And they're perfect. And not only that, God hung out with them. God would show up uh, in the afternoon and they'd just go for a walk through this beautiful garden and talk and they could ask questions. And, and they were in charge. You know, Adam had named all the animals so he knew who they were and I mean, what an adventurous place, what a beautiful place, what a glorious place. At the end of the chapter, at the end of chapter 2, it says that the man and woman were naked and unashamed. In other words, they had no self-consciousness at all. They had no self-esteem problems. They didn't, you know, no sense of embarrassment. They were so, it was so beautiful and it was so pure. I mean, I was thinking about this this week, one day when I got out of the shower and looked in the mirror, and I go, what a shame. <laughs> but it wasn't like that for them. It was like, man, this is awesome. And then chapter 3 happens. Something disrupted the apple cart of all that God had created. So the story begins to develop. It's 
you know, here they are. They're in Eden. It's awesome. One rule, that's it. But a snake shows up in the beginning of chapter 3. A serpent. The word that's used there is a word that was typically used for snake, but I don't know if it was a snake exactly like snake that we have. It becomes obvious that ultimately this talking snake is the devil is behind it somehow. Uh, Later on in 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about the the serpent, Satan, who tempted Eve. So we know that's who he is ultimately. But if you're seeing the story, here's Adam and Eve. They're just like, great, everything's awesome. And Eve's talking to a snake. The snake's talking to her. Now, there are some people who have said (coughs) that maybe she wasn't surprised because maybe all the animals could talk back then before the fall. I don't know. Um, Dr. Doolittle, a theologian, suggested that. But uh, <laughs> I don't know, people don't know who Dr. Doolittle is anymore. Sorry. I guess they haven't found a way to merchandise him to the next generation yet. But she's there talking to him. And the snake's like striking up a conversation. It says that of every, all the animals, he was the one that was the slickest. He was the salesman of the animals. He was, he was clever. And he just slides up to her and he says, so, how's it going? She's like, oh, look at it. I mean, we have everything we could ever want. And he goes, so, I hear you're not allowed to eat of the trees. She goes, oh, no, no, no. I, we can eat of the trees. It's just that one tree, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We, we're not even supposed to touch it. And I don't know if God had said that or if Adam just... Because what we read in chapter 2 is God said, if you eat that, you're going to die. That day, death comes. But he probably told Eve, look, don't even touch it. I know you. Um, (laughs) So she adds that in. She's like, no, just that one tree. I don't even touch that. And so then the serpent says, why? She goes, oh, we'll die. Well, what's death? (laughs) Nothing's ever died. What does that even mean? And then he says, you're not going to die. Come on. That's, that's preposterous. I mean, look at your life. You're fine. And, and look at that tree. It's kind of cool. And, but he says, here's the thing. Not only will it not kill you, it's going to taste really good. It's going to make you like God. God is messing with you. God wants to keep you on the farm. God wants to keep you in your place. If you eat that fruit, he knows you're going to be like him. You're going to know good and evil. You're going to know things that you never imagined when you eat that fruit. It was partly true. But he's just saying that, and then he like slides off, and she's thinking about it. And so then she goes over and she starts looking at that tree. Probably when she was talking to Adam, maybe Adam wasn't there with her, but then Adam's with her as she goes and gets this fruit. And she takes a piece of the fruit, probably wasn't an apple, I'm thinking it was a kumquat or something, but, but um, that's not a fruit, right? Um, so she takes it, and she's going, whoa, I bet that tastes really good. And she says, not only that, it's a good-looking fruit, and here's the kicker, what if it really is the shortcut to me becoming smarter. I've been feeling kind of inferior to Adam because he's always telling me about everything that happened before I was around. What if this will make me wise? So there were three things. She saw it, and it looked like, ooh, this will taste good. That's kind of in 1 John chapter 2. He talks about all temptation as being the lust of the flesh. Ooh, this will taste good. The lust of the eyes. This looks good. And the pride of life, this is going to make me something special. It's always the way the devil works. That's how temptation works. When Satan came and tempted Jesus, remember, he first said, you hungry? Yeah, I've been fasting for 40 days. Turn those rocks into bread. Boy, wouldn't some bread taste good right now? The flesh. And then he takes them up on a mountain. He shows them all these cities. He's like, you want those? Look pretty good, huh? Tried to tempt him with the eyes, what things, what it would look like. And then ultimately, he told them, throw yourself down. Angels will pick you up, and everybody's going to know who you are. That's what you came for, right? The, the pride. And so 
Eve looks at the fruit. It's like, bet it tastes good, looks good, and it'll make me wise. And so she took it and she ate it. She ate a bite of it. And then Adam was with her at this point, and he took a bite of it too. And all of a sudden, in that perfect environment, uh uh-oh, everything is messed up. Everything goes wrong. It's, It's like, what is going on here? And they, for the first time in their lives, felt ashamed. They looked at each other, and maybe they were like, I don't look the same as you, or whatever, but they, but they had this shame. And there was fear. They had never experienced fear before. All of a sudden, now there's this, there's this sense of dread of what was going to happen. They were embarrassed, and so they made clothes for themselves out of fig leaves, which really, you don't want to wear a fig leaf outfit. Um, and they hid themselves. They could no longer feel like, I can, I'm good. I can go wherever I want to go. They hid. And then God came along. And he would apparently show up in the, in the, in the late afternoon, and they would talk. And he shows up, and they're not there where he usually met them. Now, God knew where they were, and he knew what happened, but he, but he came after them, and he called to them, and he said, hey, where are you guys? And then Adam was like, well, you can't hide from God. So he calls out. He goes, yeah, uh, you kind of came at a bad time. We're naked. And this is kind of embarrassing. And God said, really? Who told you you're naked? How did you even know what naked meant? How did you know what it means to feel embarrassed? And then he said, did you eat of the tree that I told you not to eat of? There's the critical question. You've done what you've done. Now, are you going to own up to it? And Adam and Eve did what we so often do. Instead of just going, Oh, God, I don't know what to do. I did it. It was stupid. I ple- ah, what do we do? Instead, they played the blame game. God's talking to Adam, and Adam goes, oh, you want to know what happened? The woman that you gave me, thank you very much, <laughs> kind of made me do it. And then God looks at Eve, and she goes, uh, that snake that you made, I mean, he's really smart. Uh, Your creation, you know. He made me do it. The snake's like, (laughs) you know me. (laughs) And it's so interesting that their response to God looking for them was to them, for them to play the victim card, to turn on each other. Here's this couple that like, they were created for each other. There's nobody else. And yet they're blaming each other. Their fellowship is broken. They've they've lost something really dear. And now they're going, it's not my fault. It's, I mean, Adam's going, it's Eve's fault, but actually, technically, God, it's your fault because you let this happen. You gave me this kind of a woman. I had no idea. Eve's like, it wasn't for the snake. I would have never done it. I'm a victim. It's not my fault. It's a critical point for us to understand because, and and I'm not saying that no one's a victim. I mean, people are victims of all kinds of things. And in reality, I understand what Adam's saying. He's like, God, I mean, she's the only woman for me, literally. And so she did this, and you gave her to me, and I mean, you're supposed to know everything. So I feel like I'm kind of, I had no choice. She ate, I kind of had to go along with it. True. The woman, if, if you hadn't let that talking snake into the garden, then this wouldn't have happened. So I can look at it and say, Adam and Eve were both victims. But ultimately, what good does that do you? Because if you are living with the self-identity of victim and you're blaming somebody else, what can you do about it? See, The challenge that we have in life, we're all victims of all kinds of stuff. But the question is, will I take responsibility for what I have done? Because no matter who victimizes me, I still have an opportunity to make choices about 
how I'm going to respond to that. And I have the ability to respond in a way that's constructive and, and that's best. If I don't do that, if I don't take responsibility for my own actions, then I'm left with like, oh, poor me. See, because whatever you're a victim of, you can't change that. It happened. The challenge to you is to be responsible and do the best you can do with what you have. They didn't really understand that. They didn't take responsibility. Instead, they resorted to blame. So God had to hold them accountable there would and there always are consequences to sin. Now, we talk a lot about freedom, and we love the fact that, oh, let's be free, and, and you know, God creates man with a free will, and, we, and, and it's really true. I don't think God programs us like robots and makes us do what we do. If so, in Genesis 3, I'm really confused. It, it's one thing to be deterministic today because the world's all complicated, but let's take it right back to the beginning. Did God want them to do that? Is this part of his will? No, God grants people a certain level of freedom. But in the freedom, he doesn't say you don't have to suffer consequences of your choices. So for every one of us, I am free to do what I want, but I am not free to escape the consequences of what I choose to do. So that's their situation, and God says... There's a price that's going to be paid. I told you that death would be a result, and death is going to be happening from now on. You started to die the moment you ate that fruit because you established a certain precedent, and there are going to be consequences. There, have to, there has to be. And so he began to lay out for them, kind of in the form of curses, here's what's going to happen as a result of what you did. Look at verse 14. He, he starts off with the serpent. And he said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you're cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Now, this sounds like it's about snakes themselves. Maybe they used to stand upright. There's no evidence of that, but it could be. But, I mean, some people like snakes, but most, mostly we look at snakes as like, Ugh. I remember when I was a youth pastor, I took some kids out into the, into the hills for, you know, a, a camping trip. And, and the kid said, if we find a rattlesnake, can we kill it? And I go, yeah, sure. <laughs> and so they go off and they come running back and they say, this one little girl, seventh grader, hey, she killed the rattlesnake. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this is going to be good. She comes back. Walking up, she's a little tiny thing, and she has a rattlesnake as long as her body that she's already skinned, and she's going to lay the skin out on the rock to dry. And when I told her parents, I was like, oh, boy, they're going to kill me. They're like, oh, yeah, she does that all the time. <laughs> but that's the fate of a snake. A little seventh grader can skin you and be a hero. Rattle, rattle, rattle. So he starts out with that, but then he says, I'm going to put enmity, verse 15, between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This verse is so important for us, because in cursing the serpent, he talks about the seed of the woman, the offspring of the woman, and he, and he speaks of her seed as being a singular individual who someday is going to crush the head of the serpent, even though his heel would be bruised. And this is what people call proto-evangelism, the first time the gospel is presented. Because what, what God is saying right to the serpent, rubbing his nose in it, is, look, the day is going to come when the seed of the woman will crush you, will finish you off, will kill you. You'll bruise his heel. And of course, as Jesus was hung on the cross and a nail was slammed through his feet and all that kept him alive was pushing the pain of those feet, his, he, took, he had a, a wound in his heel. But that day when Jesus died, he defeated Satan forever and his head was crushed. So that's a part of the curse that's put on Satan, 
is actually what happened at the cross. But God goes on, and to the woman, he said, you have consequences. I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. You know, they didn't have any kids at this time. But what he said, a part of this curse is, I mean, I got good news and bad news. The good news is you're going to have a kid. The bad news is it's going to hurt really bad. But not only that, it's not just giving birth. It's having kids. It's raising them. There's nothing but pain. Her first son is going to kill her second son. So God says, this isn't going to be pretty for you. This is going to be awful. And then he says also, your desire will be for your husband. And that's a hard phrase to translate. Um, some people would, would say that it refers to the fact that she wants to have the, to be in the place of her husband. And I think sometimes that can definitely be true. And it's probably what happened when she ate the apple. It's like Adam should have been there and in charge and he should have been dealing with it. But instead, she took the leadership. And so a part of this may be, and, and there are some people who say that it just means that even though men are horrible and, and when they make you pregnant, you're going to go through a lot of pain, uh, you know, but still you're going to want it. You're going to come back for more. But it, it, <laughs> either way, the whole thing is you're going to want something, but the truth is you're going to be dominated by a man. And however you look at it, it's undeniable. History is a story. It doesn't make it right, but history is a story of men abusing women, mistreating them, taking advantage of them. And all this is a part of the kind of death that happened as a result of people making bad choices. Every man who dominates a woman is totally in sin, but it's still, God said, it's going to happen. He doesn't want it to happen. It's not his will, but it's a result of sin. And so, and then he talks to Adam and he says, look, you listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. Now, the New Testament, Paul tells us that, that through Adam, all sin entered into mankind. So, guys, remember this. The first sin was listening to your wife. But, um, <laughs> but I digress. But because of it, he said, you're going to be working all the days of your lives. There's going to be thorns and thistles, and you are going to make a living by the sweat of your brow. You're going to get up every day, and if you don't work, you're not going to eat, and your family is going to be depending on you to do that. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard, and you were created out of dust, and you're going to work until you return to dust. And that's basically your fate for not being the man that you should have been, for not listening to me, this is the result. Now, it doesn't mean that in all these cases with the curse that we shouldn't do what we can to minimize them. That's ultimately God's going to take them away. So if you don't have to work by the sweat of your brow, hey, great, that's awesome. Um, there are other ways that you're going to pay the price for your sin, though. And so then it says in verse 20 that Adam named his wife Eve. He was just calling her woman before that. Now he gave her the name Eve, which means life. He said, you are life. Why? Probably because of the promise in verse 15. Because from her, I mean, a woman doesn't contribute seed in childbirth. The man does. But there's this weird promise that the woman's going to have a seed. It's referring to the virgin birth. And so he figures she's the key. Her seed is going to fix all that. You know, later when, um, when Cain was born, um, it, they named him a choir, like, I've arrived. Because they probably thought, here's the guy that's going to crush the head of the serpent and we can get back in Eden. But it was going to take a little longer than that. But he called her life or the mother of, of life, really. And then God, talking to himself in the Godhead, said, we got a problem here because there's still a tree of life. And as messed up as their lives are going to be because of their sin, 
they're on their way to death, the worst thing in the world is if they would live forever. So we've got to get them out of the garden. We've got to get them away from the tree of life. Tree of life later shows up in heaven, by the way. But he said, I'm going to put a guard next to the door of heaven and keep them from it because as they deteriorate, they're going to want to die. They're going to be ready to die, and it'll actually be a kind thing when they do. And so kicked them out of the garden, and that's the end of their idyllic existence there and the start of the rest of the Bible and the rest of history, the world that we live in, started right here. Now, when we look at this, we want to go, okay, what does this mean to us? Now, there are some people who will see this as, okay, good, it's Adam and Eve's fault. This world is messed up because of what Adam and Eve did. We just inherited their sin, original sin. No, actually, we're pretty good at creating our own sins. And so if we respond to this by just blaming them, we've got it all wrong. Because when I look at this and I go, okay, I want to get inside Eve's head and Adam's head and figure out, why did they do this? They had it made. It was, it was, it was a perfect existence. Why in the world did they blow it like that? Well, then I have to look in the mirror and I have to ask myself, and why do I do the same thing? Why do I do things that I know God says, this is going to kill you. This is going to ruin your life. I mean, I was thinking about this this week, and I was out in Colorado, and they had all this, I mean, great sweet food and everything. And I, and I know if I eat it, I'm going to die. It's like God has told me. If you eat this stuff, it's going to kill you. It's going to make you live less. And so fortunately, because I'm studying this passage all week, I, I, I pretty much, okay, like a couple bonbons or something. But other than that, <laughs> I, I did pretty well. But most of the time, let's face it, we all eat things that we know will kill us. And, and we read about it. The information is there. We know it's bad for us. There's nothing good or nutritious about most of the stuff that we eat. But we do it. Why? It's just like Eve. Now, so first of all, I think, okay, why did Eve do this? Because if I can figure out why she does it, maybe I'll figure out why I do it, why I do things that I know are bad and that will shorten my lifespan and that will bring more destruction into my life. Well, the first thing that comes to mind right away is partly why she did it is because, honestly, she really didn't believe what the Word of God said. I mean, God had said, if you eat that, death is coming. And, and again, some people go, yeah, why didn't they die the very day? Well, they did start to die the very day, but a fate worse than death is losing your child, especially at the hands of one of your other children. And so, but death was introduced, and there were pl probably plenty of times when they wished they had just plain died, but death started at this point. So if God said it, why in the world didn't she believe it? Well, for the same reason why we don't believe what God says. There's so much that the Bible says that we just don't do it. We say we believe it. We all, I mean, we call ourselves Christians and we're like, yeah, the Bible's the, it says Holy Bible, it's the Word of God, it's inspired by God, and, and we want to argue with people about some of the little meticulous details about the Bible because we're like, no, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says that you're bad. The Bible says, But then there's all kinds of stuff in the Bible that could be life-giving, and, and we don't believe it because we don't do it. Of course, you only believe parts of the Bible that you actually do. So, for instance, you know, we read the Bible, and it says something like, hey, you need to meditate on the Word of God. And if you do that, everything that you do will prosper in Psalm 1. So how regularly do we really meditate on the Word of God? Do we do it as if we believe that it will actually make us successful in everything that we do? No, not, not most of the time. Honestly, we just don't believe it. And so at our own peril, we choose to ignore that opportunity. We choose to ignore that blessing. Now, at the same time, there's stuff... There's stuff in the Bible about eating too much. 
that it will destroy you. But, hey, on big holidays, it's like we're celebrating gluttony. And, and uh, you know, it's the, on the greatest holiday of all, the Super Bowl, is the time when we eat the most <laughs> junk and chemicals and everything. And so, you know, that's, we just do it. We really don't take it seriously. The Bible says, makes it really clear, if you sleep in and you're lazy, you're going to be broke. But do we believe it? Not always. The Bible says if you hang around with angry people, it's going to mess you up and destroy you. But we all have friends that have anger problems. The Bible says that you'll become like the people that you associate with, but is that what we do? The Bible says that in a marriage that a husband needs to treat a wife like she's delicate and precious. And if not, you're going to end up ruining her or losing her. We know that. But do we do it? I see all the time that it doesn't. The Bible says for a wife that if you keep nagging your husband and arguing with him, he's going to start living on the rooftop and eventually out in the wilderness. But we're like, no, that's not going to happen. We don't believe what he says. But it's critical that we decide to believe what God says. Because the very foundation of bringing more death into our life with ripping ourselves apart starts with, do you believe what God says? And in that, I don't, I mean, Eve only disobeyed one thing God said. We do it all the time. You know, the Bible says that if you take of what you have and of all your increase and give it to him, he'll give you more. So, so anybody who doesn't have enough, it's kind of obvious you don't, don't believe God. But what do we do about that? Well, you know, it's the way it is. The Bible says don't go into debt. Don't borrow money. Ah, oh, but it's so convenient. Well, you apparently don't believe what he says if that's been your practice. So I think that's the first thing. A second thing, when I look at Eve, I think maybe she was bored. You know, maybe she's like in the garden. She has everything she wants, but she's not content because she just had a feeling. There must be something better than this. There must be more than this. And, and so... When somebody makes a suggestion, it's like, yeah, you know, it was getting kind of boring around here. It was, I'm, I, yeah, I have everything, but I want more. And so too with us. We, we look at our lives and we either choose to be content with what we have. Now, that doesn't mean that we want to just stay with what we have, but it means that I'm happy where I am right now, where God has me at this stage of my life. I can still be responsible. I can still do things, and I expect, and for them, certainly, God was going to do more things in their lives if they hadn't messed it up. But it's the same thing for us. Lack of contentment leads us to making decisions and doing things that we would have never done otherwise. And so we're the same as Eve in that, I think. Ultimately, I think... At the core of a lot of why she probably did what she did is the, the whole thing of wanting it now. It was impatience. The temptation from Satan is almost always about, you can have it now, you don't have to wait. I mean, all the sins that we do are usually trying to take a shortcut to where we think we want to go with who, what we're made to do. I mean, isn't that why people go into debt? To get something that maybe if they were patient, they could get it and not be paying interest? Isn't that why people cheat on their spouse? Because it's like, yeah, I suppose eventually if we work on this marriage, it'll end up being somewhat satisfying. But I'm thinking, in some ways, if I'm you know, involved with someone on the side, I might be a little more at peace, and it could even hurt my, help my marriage. Who knows? And there are a lot of people who believe that or just think, oh, I, I think I started wrong. Let's start this over and kickstart it with, the, with a younger version. And so, you know, we end up, what we're doing, God was going to do it if we would give him time, but they didn't want time. Now, here Eve is going, I want to know more. I want to be smarter. Are you kidding me? It's just been a short time, and look at all you've learned. Look at all you've experienced, and every day you get to talk to God. You can ask him questions. He'll tell you stuff. In fact, wouldn't it have made sense to go, 
that fruit does look good, and that sounds kind of interesting. Maybe God's sinister. I think I'll ask him this afternoon when he shows up. I think I'll hear what he has to say. I'll be able to tell. If God's acting kind of fishy, maybe that's it. Maybe I should talk to Adam, and we'll kick it around. And, you know, the tree's still going to be there tomorrow. I don't have to rush into this. But she needed it now. Okay, yeah, God teaches me more every day, but I want a lot more. I want to leapfrog it. And so often, that's what we're tempted to do as well, to short-circuit it. It's really what Satan was doing with Eve. He, he, you know, what, what he was saying, I mean, what Satan was doing with Eve, but also what Satan was doing with Jesus. He's like, look, you know you're going to eventually eat. Do it now. You know you're going to eventually rule over the world. Do it now. You know you're going to be celebrated as the Messiah. Do it now. Take a shortcut. Man, don't go through what you're going to have to go through to get that. Just grab it now. Every temptation is ultimately trying to get us to take a shortcut. I mean, that, salesmen know this, right? They put a, there's something that you don't even know if you want, so they make you want it more by telling you it's today only. This is, this is a once-in-a-lifetime deal. Well, so what if it's something I don't even want, but there's something inside of us that's like, ooh, yeah, I can get it, and I can get it now. And you go, what's that car going to cost me? Well, how much can you afford to pay every month? Let's not think of it as what it costs. And I know the car that you have now, you still owe a bunch on it. Oh, we'll just roll that in. It's like it's going to be free almost. So you go, ooh, yeah, that's great. No, nobody is going to tell you, you know what, if you save up, someday you'll be able to have this and you'll actually own it. No, because that's not the way it works. But what works is, and Ivan, I'm sorry for picking on car salesmen. I, I need to find another way to illustrate this. But the way that it works ultimately is every temptation is getting us to get it now. You go to Costco, and there's, eh, we have people that work at Costco too. But, you know, you think, well, look at what I can save if I buy like a year's supply of toilet paper. That'll be great because we'll never run out of toilet paper. <laughs> and, and all that. You, you know how much, like with food stuff, you're always throwing out a bunch because, oh, yeah, I got kind of carried away here. That's the way temptation is. And we can look at Eve and go, how in the world did she do what she did? Or we can look at ourselves and say, man, I do the same thing. There's nothing new under the sun. And we so often blame sin being in the world for us being the way we are, but our great-great-great-grandma Eve did just what we do. I'm not so sure that them eating the fruit is what may, makes me want to eat the donut. It's just she would have eaten a donut if she had seen one, and I would have eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's just we're the same. We're related. And so in seeing what happened to her, we realize what happens to us. This is the same minefield that we negotiate every day. And so we have to ask ourselves, do I believe what he says? And am I going to take him up on what he tells me to do and trust him for the results of that? Or am I going to get bored and antsy? Am I just going to, you know, out of some kind of compulsion or dissatisfaction, am I going to decide that if I do this, then I'll be satisfied, instead of finding a way to be satisfied where I am. And for all of us, too, the, the thought of, am I willing to wait? Am I going to be patient? Will I let God do what he's going to do to help me understand, to help me have what I need to have, to change my life in a way that I'm now not susceptible to every huckster that comes along and tells me, if you get this, then you'll have everything that you want. When you were a kid, don't you remember thinking that if I could have that bike, I'd never want anything again. I, in fact, make it my Christmas present, my birthday present, my Easter present, my, and it's fine. I'll never want anything else. I don't know. You want that bike today? Is that really such a big deal? Did it satisfy you when, you know, by a week later you were leaving it outside and it was rusting? 
learn to be satisfied where we are and stop being obsessed with thinking that this will do it. We are slaves to stuff if we don't learn to be content where we are. And that's what Eve showed us too. And God shows us, no, it's not going to be getting more and more. It's not going to be getting what you want now. It's, it's not about, you know, shortcuts. It's about trusting me and going with what I say. Now, with all of this, I think it's a challenge for all of us because I don't know about you, but I can see Eve in me all the time. I can really see Eve in you, but I, but I hope you can see Eve in you. And so this is, this is pretty radical for us. If this is where it went wrong, this is where it's still going wrong. Just a very simple explanation as to how it broke, as to how we bring death into our lives, as to how our lives are shortened and the quality of our life is obliterated because of doing the same kinds of things. But having said all that, I think that in this chapter, in this story, there's some incredible grace that shows up. Now, if I was God and I had given them everything they needed and made it very clear, there's just one rule, just don't eat that tree, and then they do it first thing, they listen to a talking snake instead of God, I, would, I wouldn't have come and looked for them. <laughs> I would have gone, that's it for them. I probably would have just burned down the Garden of Eden and, and, and just destroyed them and said, this was an interesting experiment that went horribly wrong. <laughs> I'm not going to do this again. But God shows up and he's kind to them. He's asking questions like, hey, where are you guys? Hey, what's the matter? What's up? He was nice. And even in giving these curses, he wasn't like, oh, ha, ha, ha. In the middle of cursing the serpent, he presents the gospel. He foretells the story of ultimate grace, that the seed of a woman, a man who was born of a virgin, would come and would pay the penalty for sin, would destroy Satan, and would give us another start at life. And how gracious and how amazing. And even in kicking them out of the garden, that was so gracious. You know, death is such a gift at a certain point. You know, when with uh, Helen DeGroote, who passed away this week, I, you know, they were so relieved because she had been so miserable and, and was in, she was so confused and, and it's like she was just the sweetest woman, but you wouldn't want her to keep living forever in that kind of a state. And, and so, so often for, you know, we need to realize that, wow, protecting them from living forever in this condition and just deteriorating and getting worse and worse, it was a very gracious thing for God to do, to say, you know, you brought death into your life, but it's temporary. And I'll still have a place for you where you will live forever, but it's not going to be in this planet that you just ruined. So his grace flows throughout the whole thing. And I just want to say to you, if you've never accepted that gift of a loving God, this is what the Bible is about. It's about what went wrong with you and about what God did to make it right. And all you have to do to reset your life is to just acknowledge. Don't stop blaming people. And quit trying to excuse yourself and quit thinking that the more you get, maybe someday you'll arrive. Instead, just fess up and go, God, I can't blame anybody else, man. I've done a bunch of stupid things that have ruined my life. But if you have a holy seed who can have my sins forgiven and will give me a fresh start at life, I want that. And it's as simple as acknowledging that Jesus Christ, the one who was born of a woman, Mary, a virgin, and then gave his life for us and declared, you can live forever if you put your trust in me. Listen to me. If you don't know him, this is your chance right now. The only chance you have. Otherwise, you're just going to keep on dying and spreading your death and being miserable. Your life can start over because God loves you that much. 
And if you've never made that decision, I would ask you, first of all, what do you have to lose? But secondly, I would just urge you, I beg you, just respond to him. It's not a scam. It's all for you. It cost him the life of his son. And all you have to do is put your faith in him. If, you, if you'd like to do that, just a very simple prayer that it takes. And there'll be people up here in the front who just love praying with people. And they would love to lead you in a prayer for you to receive the sacrifice for your sins, to be able to start your life over, forget all the damage that's been done to you, forget all the damage you've done, get a clean slate today. So I pray that if you've never done that, you'll come up here and you'll do it today. And for the rest of us, are we going to keep imitating Eve? Or are we going to finally wise up and understand that our future rests in us believing what God says and in resisting all of the temptation that's going to end up destroying us? Our lives can be so much better than they are. Let's start paying attention to him and listening and, and living that way. Let's see the lies of Satan for what they are. Let's pray. God, thank you for relaying this story to us. And no one really who could write could have been there to write this down if you hadn't prompted Adam to share it with others and for it to eventually be written down in the scriptures and we can read the story today. But this explains so much about what's broken and damaged in the world. It explains so much about why we do what we do, and it provides this glorious hope that there's a way out even now. So for the people who haven't taken that way yet, I, I pray that you would just draw them to yourself by your spirit today. Give them the courage to come up and, and admit that they are responsible for their lives and they need help. So God, draw people to yourself today. For all of us who have already taken that step, help us to stop acting like Eve. Help us to start living like what we wish she had done. Taken responsibility and believed in you with her daily decisions. So help us to be more wise. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.